Okay, as promised, we're going to take a serious look at Daniel. And in Jesus' own words, let the reader understand. Uh, as he said uh, in Matthew 24, so when you see the abomination of desolation, spoken of by the prophet Daniel, standing in the holy place, let the reader understand. So what Jesus is saying, he's saying, I expect you to read Daniel if you wanna know about end time events. And Daniel, by the way, is the only prophet that Jesus even specifically encouraged to read. So it's that important. If Jesus says it's important to read, it's important. Now, when we look at Daniel and compare it to the Antichrist, Daniel addresses some very important things about the Antichrist. He's gonna reveal the geographical location from where the Antichrist empire will emerge, the timing of this empire, the nature of his persecutions against the saints, and what motivates the Antichrist, really, what motivates him. So then when we look at the book of Daniel itself, we can break it up into two sections, chapters one through six, which records the events of Daniel's life, and then chapter seven through 12, which records the four apocalyptic visions given to Daniel by God. And so that's what we're gonna focus on, but there's one other chapter of eschatological interest, in time interest, and that is the dream given to Nebuchadnezzar in Daniel 2 of the giant statue. So without delay, let's get into it. And first and foremost, let me just say that we're gonna focus on uh, events that will have a direct relationship, relationship to Revelation and not necessarily kingdoms and events that are historical and well-documented, okay? So Daniel 2. Verse 31, and, and just to set the scene here, uh, King Nebuchadnezzar had a dream, it troubled him. He went to all of his sorcerers and magicians and says, well, interpret me the dream. And they said, okay, tell us the dream. He goes, I can't. You're gonna have to tell me what I dreamed and the interpretation. Well, everybody backed away except Daniel. He's the one that would agree to take it on. So now we start up in verse 31, where Daniel says, <clears throat> you saw, O king, and behold, a great image, this image mighty and of exceeding brightness stood before you, and its appearance was frightening. The head of this image was of fine gold, and its chest and arms of silver, and its middle and thighs of bronze, and its legs of iron, and its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. So there's five divisions here, right? Verse 34, and as you look, a stone was cut out, but by no human hand. And of course, well, that stone being the Jesus Christ himself. And it struck the image on its feet of iron and clay and broke them to pieces. And then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold all together were broken in pieces and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors and the wind just carried them away so that not a trace of them could be found. But the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. Verse 36, now it goes into the interpretation. Now we will tell you the king its interpretation. You are the head of gold. Another kingdom, which will Find out it's Medo-Persia. Inferior to you shall rise after you, and yet a third kingdom. This is the Grecian, uh, Alexander the Great, a bronze, which shall rule over all the earth. Um, all, over all the earth, this is a hyperbole, which is very common in, uh, in uh, Hebrew literature. It just means over all the territory, okay? Um, doesn't include China, for example. And there shall be a fourth kingdom, strong as iron, because iron breaks to pieces and shatters all things. And like iron that crushes, it shall break and crush all these other three kingdoms. And as you saw the feet and toes, partly of potter's clay, partly of iron, it shall be a divided kingdom. But some of the firmness of iron shall be in it, 
just as you saw the iron mixed with soft clay, and as the toes of the feet were partly iron and partly clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly brittle. And as you saw the iron mixed with soft clay, so they will mix with one another in marriage, but they will not hold together just as iron does not mix with clay. He goes on, and in the days of those kings, and now he's referring to the kings of the feet and the toes, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that shall never be destroyed, nor shall the kingdom be left to another people. It shall break in pieces all these kingdoms and bring them to an end, and it shall stand forever. Just as you saw that a stone which is the Messiah, was cut from a mountain by no human hand and that it broke in pieces as the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold. A great God has made known to the king what shall be after this. The dream is certain and its interpretation sure. What amazing faith and confidence in humility that Daniel had. Okay, <clears throat> so we're going to review the fourth kingdom and the feet and toes kingdom. The fourth kingdom, the iron's leg kingdom, well, as strong as iron, right? And it shall break and crush all that remain of the three previous kingdoms. This is a very important fact. So in order to be a fourth iron legs kingdom, it has to do this. Now the feet and toes kingdom of iron and clay. This will be the existing kingdom that God's kingdom will be established and break in pieces, which makes this the kingdom of the Antichrist. The iron portion of it is strong, but his feet have iron and potter's clay, making this kingdom partly strong, partly brittle, as it says. And they will mix with one another in marriage, but they will not hold together, just as iron does not mix with clay. So what all, does all this mean? We'll hold that thought and just... Uh, We'll bring it all together in a few moments. Now, most theologians, they say the Roman Empire, that is the fourth kingdom. And the Roman Empire revived, that's the feet and toes kingdom. But we have to ask the question, does Rome really meet the scriptural qualifications that are specified? In particular, Daniel 2.40, where it says it, that kingdom, the fourth kingdom, will crush and break all the others, all the others, the Babylonian, the Medo-Persia, and Greece. And since none of these kingdoms coexisted at the same time, what does crush and break even mean? Now, most likely it means to take over the territory of the other three kingdoms, as well as imparting new kingdom values. That's part of the crushing and breaking on the culture, on the language, on the beliefs of the first three kingdoms. So let's review some of this. What was the religion of the Roman Empire? Oh, it wasn't really Roman, it was Greek gods. Ah, but they had Roman names on it, so uh, instead of Apollo, there was Zeus, or maybe it was vice versa. Well, that's not really crushing it, is it? Well, how about Israel and the Hebrew nation? Jerusalem. What about the temple there? They crushed that, right? No. In fact, King Herod expanded and renovated the existing temple. He wanted it to be his temple as a gift to the Jewish people that would meet the glory of the previous temple of Solomon. Well, that's hardly crushing Israel's religion, is it? What about language? Language of the Roman Empire. What was that? Uh, oh yeah, Latin. Okay, they still Latin in the Middle East, right? No. The Middle East during the time of Jesus was Aramaic, Hebrew, and Greek. In fact, the New Testament was originally written in Greek. Rome did not crush that one either. Another thing that we need to keep in mind is that this is a dream given to the king of Babylonia, to, to King Nebuchadnezzar, which means the dream, the greater part of the dream in his kingdoms 
are from a Babylonian point of view. It's Babylon-centric. Uh, so uh, these territories, well, they would have to overtake Babylon, which, oh, by the way, Rome never occupied. Hmm. Well, what was Rome? Well, Rome was powerful. No question there. But Rome was Eurocentric. It occupied the land around the Mediterranean Sea, which included Israel, of course, but it never occupied anything east of the Euphrates or the Tigris rivers, which would be the heartland of Babylonia and the heartland of Medo-Persia. So Rome flunks out. Okay, do we have an empire that comes later after Rome uh, that, shall we say, is at least as big as the other uh, three empires? Yeah, we got the Islamic Caliphate of the Ottoman Empire. So does this meet scriptural qualifications? Well, let's look at it. First of all, you know, the name Islam, what does that mean? It means submission to the laws of Allah. Okay, already we're coming on strong. The Islamic Caliphate, as a matter of fact, they dictated the law, the governments, the language, the military, even the sexual and hygienic practices of those that were under its authority. Wow. What about language? It imposed it. It imposed the Arabic language on its conquered people. And even today, we got Jordan, Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, and North Africa. Guess what they speak? They speak Arabic. Well, the Persians and the Turks, they went back to their own language. Yes, they did, but guess what they did do? They put their language in the Arabic alphabet. Wow. So the Islam Caliphate imposed their religion and culture on those it cultured, on, on those it conquered. And in addition to that, they, was, they went around systematically erasing, destroying evidence of any previous religions uh, or any non-Islamic cultures. A little more of their history, the Arabs in 634 to 644 AD, they conquered such some 36,000 cities or strongholds. They destroyed some 4,000 Christian churches and they erected some 1,400 Muslim mosques. In 848, 846 AD, they even went after Europe. They sacked the basilicas, of old St. Peter's and St. Paul's outside the walls, but they were unable to enter Rome itself because of the massive Aurelian walls uh, that were just impenetrable. So the Ottoman Empire, they became one of the largest, most powerful, and longest lasting empire in the history of the world. So why was it being ignored by theologians? I can only speculate, but it's, it's mind boggling. The Islamic Caliphate and the Ottoman Empire, they're the perfect example of a total, totalitarian regime and ideology. Okay, now let's fold in the Daniel 2 prophecy on the feet and toes. How does the Islamic Caliphate relate to that prophecy? And we'll re refresh our minds as you saw the feet and toes, partly of potter's clay, partly of iron. It shall be a divided kingdom, but some firmness of the iron shall be in it, just as you saw iron mixed with the soft clay. And as the toes of the feet were partly iron and partly clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly brittle. And as you saw the iron mixed with soft clay, so they will mix with one another in marriage. But they will not hold together just as iron does not mix with clay. Now you see, uh, I'm bolting the words mix. Why am I doing that? Okay, first and foremost, Daniel's not all written in Hebrew. From Daniel chapter two, verse four until seven, verse 28, it is written in Aramaic. Now the Aramaic word for mix or to combine, guess what that word is? Arabic. And its Hebrew equivalent is something very similar, Arab. Wow. Okay. Let's look a little deeper. Where did the Arabic nations come from? 
Well, they were the descendants of Ishmael and Esau, and they had intermarried among all the desert pagan tribes and became collectively known as the mixed ones, mixed with one another in marriage, quote unquote. This is the origin of the present name of Arabs, okay? They are known as the mixed desert people. Okay, let's continue. Because also we're talking about, as you saw the feet and toes partly of potter's clay and partly of iron, it shall be a divided kingdom. Wow. Didn't really see that in the Calvet, did we, or, or did we? I'm not so sure, but yes, maybe we did. And here's what happened. After Muhammad's death, there was division between the Shia, minority sect, which is about 14% of all Muslims, and the Sunnis, majority sect, which is about 86% of all Muslims. And so what was the disagreement? Well, the Shias believed the successorship of Muhammad belonged to Muhammad's relatives. So it was a bloodline that needed to uh, be followed for future leadership. Uh, the Sunnis go, no, 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 no. We believe the successorship of Muhammad belongs to Muhammad's companions. You know, we're the loyal ones or the Sahaba. And we know what resulted out of all this. This resulted in a never ending bloodshed of sectarian violence that is still happening today. The hatred of each other is just, it's unfathomable, but it's there. It has nothing to do with praying three times a day or five times a day. It has everything to do with who has power of the Islamic world. So the Islamic empire, it's a perfect fit of the Daniel chapter two verse 41 to 43 criteria. So let's read on because there's some other things we could look at. And one would be, okay, well, what's God's thoughts on these nations, on these countries? Because if God is not angry at them, then we can exclude them from the list. Well, guess what? The nations that the prophets say that God is gonna come against in the Old Testament on the day of the Lord, each and every one of them are Islamic today. Psalms 83, starting verse four. This is a good example where uh, it starts off saying, they say, they being this collective group of nations that are coming after Israel, they say, come, let us wipe them out as a nation. Let the name of Israel be remembered no more, for they conspire with one accord. Against you they make a covenant. The tents of Edom and of Ishmaelites, Moab and the Hagrites, Gibal and Ammon, Amalek, Philistia, and the, with the inhabitants of Tyre, Ashur also have joined them, and they are the strong arm of the children of Lot. Okay, so now we've identified those that were enemies of Israel. In modern names, we're talking Jordan, we're talking Saudi Arabia, we're talking Golan Heights, uh, we're talking the Sinai Peninsula, we're talking the Negev, we're talking the Gaza Strip, we're talking the Palestinian Authority, their land, we're talking Lebanon, we're talking Syria, Iran, Iraq. Hmm, I got two more examples. We won't really read them all because hopefully the point is made, but I'll start off with Ezekiel 30 verse 1. The word of Yahweh came to me, son of man, prophesy and say, thus saith the Lord Yahweh God. Wail. Alas for the day, for the day is near. The day of Yahweh is near. It will be a day of clouds, the cloud rider, remember? A time of doom for the nations. A sword shall come upon Egypt. And then he lists others, Cush, Put, Lud, 
Arabia, and Libya. All that will have to endure the wrath of the Lord. So we got, we've added to that list Libya, North Africa. Uh, the one thing in common that they all have is hatred for Israel and the Jews. Zephaniah had something similar. Uh, seek the Lord, all you humble the land, who do his just command, seek righteousness, seek humility. Perhaps you may be hidden from the day of the anger of the Lord. And then they list off Gaza, Ashkelon, Ashdod, Ekron, Cherethites, Philistines, so all parts of Gaza Strip, Ammonites, Moab, Jordan, Ammonites, Jordan, Syria, Cushites, Sudan, Assyria, um, Turkey, Lebanon, and Iraq, and Syria, and Nineveh, it's a new one there, which is uh, the city of Mosul in northern Iraq. So um, God definitely has a grudge on these nations because they hate his people and want to destroy them and his land and his temple. Now, having said that, let's go from chapter two to chapter seven, verse one. In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon. So now we got a new king on the throne. Nebuchadnezzar has passed. Daniel saw a dream and visions of his head as he laid down, and then he wrote them down the dream and told the sum of the matter. Daniel declared, I saw my vision by night and behold, the four winds of heaven were stirring up the great sea. The great sea here in this context would be the sea of the Gentiles. And four great beasts came up out of the sea, out of the Gentiles, Gentile nations, different from one another. Okay, and then we're gonna see some real strong parallels with chapter two. The first was like a lion. It had wings, eagle's wings, uh, the Babylonians. Uh, then as I looked at its wings were plucked off and lifted up from the ground and made to stand on two feet like man. And the mind of a man was given to it. And behold, another beast, a second one. So this is all history, like a bear, Medo-Persian empire. It was raised up on one side. It was kind of lopsided. And it had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth. Babylon. Media and Persia, that's what made up the, the Medo-Persian Empire. And it was told, arise and devour much flesh. We read on, verse six. After this, I look and behold another, a third kingdom, like a leopard with four wings. This would be the Grecian Empire under Alexander the Great, of a bird on his back. And the beast had four heads. That'd be the four generals of Alexander the Great. And dominion was given to it, to those four generals. And after this, after Alexander had died, and after this, I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, terrifying and dreadful and exceedingly strong. It had great iron teeth. It devoured and broken pieces and stamped what was left with its feet. It was different from all of the beasts that were before it, and it had... Ten horns. I considered the horns, and behold, there came up another horn, a little one. And we know who that is, right? The Antichrist. Before which three of the first horns were plucked up by the roots. So there was three horns that did not agree with the little horn, right? Off of their heads. And behold, in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man and a mouth speaking great things. Or in Revelation Thessalonians, great blasphemies against the Lord Most High. Verse nine, as I looked, thrones were placed and the ancient of days, that be God the Father, took his seat. His clothing was white as snow and the hair of his head like pure wool. His throne was fiery flames, its wheels with were burning fire, a stream of fire issued and came out from before him. A thousand thousand served him and 10,000 times 10,000 stood before him. The court sat in judgment and the books were open. I looked then because of the sound of the great words that the horn was speaking, that being the Antichrist and Satan. Um, and I looked and the beast was killed and its body destroyed and given over to be burned with fire. This being the lake of fire that's um, finalized in Revelation 19, verse 20. 
As for the rest of the beasts, their dominion was taken care of, but their lives were prolonged for a season and a time. Verse 13, I saw in the night visions and behold, with the clouds of heaven, here comes the cloud rider. There came one like a son of man and he came to the ancient of days to God the father in his throne room and was presented before him. And to him, Jesus, the lamb that we read in chapter four of Revelation was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples and nations and tribes, correction and languages should serve him, Jesus Christ. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away and his kingdom, one that shall not be destroyed. Verse 15, as for me, Daniel, my spirit within me was anxious and the visions of my head alarmed me and I approached one of those who stood there. I mean, Daniel was not shy and asked him the truth concerning all this. So he told me and made known to me the interpretation of all the things, of the things. These four great beasts are four kings who shall rise out of the earth. But the saints of the most high, they shall receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, forever and ever. Hallelujah. Thank you, almighty God. Verse 19. <clears throat> Then I desired to know the truth of the fourth beast because he wasn't satisfied yet. I got to know more. Which was different from all the rest, exceedingly terrifying with its teeth of iron and claws of bronze and which devoured and broke in pieces and stamped what was left of the other three kingdoms with its feet and about the 10 horns that were on his head and the other horn that came up and before which three of them fell. And the horn that has eyes and a mouth that spoke great things that seemed greater than its companions. And as I looked, this horn made war with the saints. And not only made war with the saints, but prevailed over them. The great tribulation. Until the ancient of days came. The parousia, the second coming of Jesus Christ, the day of the Lord. And judgment was given for the saints of the Most High, and the time came when the saints possessed the kingdom. Verse 23. Thus he said, as for the fourth beast, there shall be a fourth kingdom on earth, which shall be different from all the kingdoms, and it shall devour the whole earth and trample it down and break it to pieces. Now as for the ten horns out of this kingdom, ten kings shall arise and another shall rise after them. He shall be different from the former ones and shall put down three kings, so off of their heads. He, the Antichrist, shall speak words even against the Most High and shall wear out the saints of the Most High. Once again, we're referring to the Great Tribulation and shall think to change the times and the law and they shall be given into his hand for a time times and half a time, three and a half years. Okay. <clears throat> the Antichrist shall think, which kind of tells me maybe he wasn't entirely successful, to change the times and the law. Now, what does he mean? Well, first of all, we got to put this into an Islamic mindset. For the Islamic mindset, what? The first day of the week starts Sunday. And they work Sunday through Thursday, five days. And then Friday is the, is the holy day, the day of prayer. Saturday is the day off, right? Not so in the Western world. The Western world is what? Sundays is the day of church. Uh, Monday through Friday is our work days. And Saturday is the day for uh, uh, synagogues. Okay, obviously an Islamic caliphate would want to change all of that. So also the fourth kingdom that we've now read about in Daniel 7, how does that compare to the kingdom of Antichrist and how does that compare to Revelation? Well, huh, the parallel is uncanny. So 
what we just read in, Re in Daniel 7 about the fourth beast that was exceedingly terrifying, that had 10 horns on his head, um, and then there's another horn that came out and three of them fell, so there's seven remaining heads or seven remaining horns. How does that compare to Revelation? Well, Revelation 13, verse 1, and I saw a beast rising out of the sea, the sea of the Gentiles, with 10 horns, with seven heads, because three had been lopped off, with 10 diadems. So, you know, the, the, the nations were still remaining. Um, I guess the Antichrist was acting for three of them, their kings. And then let's go to Revelation 17. And he carried me away in the spirit into a wilderness and I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast that was full of blasphemous names and it had what? Seven heads and 10 horns. It's verse seven. But the angel said to me, why do you marvel? I will tell you the mystery of the woman and of the beast with the seven heads and the 10 horns that carries her. And then verse 12, and the 10 horns that you saw are 10 kings who have not yet received royal power, but they are to receive authority. Once again, they are to be given power, not that they're earning it on their own, as kings for one hour together with the beast, the Antichrist. And verse 16, and the 10 horns that you saw, they and the beast will hate the prostitute and they will make her desolate and naked and devour her flesh and burn her up with fire. We're not gonna talk about the prostitute now. We will talk about that when we get into Revelation 17. One other thing though that I think is important to note in this, so we got the fourth kingdom. What about the kingdom of the feet and the toes? Well, guess what? How many toes are on two feet? 10. Think that's a coincidence? I don't think so. So, Daniel 7 ends, verse 26. But the court shall sit in judgment, and his dominion shall be taken away to be consumed and destroyed to the end. So, this vision, if anybody misunderstands, it's not all fulfilled historically. It's all going to happen at the end. To the end is the eschaton, the last day, the end of time. And the kingdom and the dominion and the greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of Most High, His elect, those that hold to the testimony of their Lord and Savior, the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ, Yeshua HaMashiach. His kingdom shall be an everlasting kingdom and all dominions shall serve and obey him. Okay, so now we've, we've looked at uh, two main prophecies, visions given in Daniel 2 and Daniel 7. We have started looking at kingdoms. Well, let's look at what they look like on the map, okay? Because sometimes a picture is worth a thousand words. Okay, the first great beast. This is the Babylonian Empire. That's the gray shaded area. The red dot you see is Babylon in between the Euphrates and the Tigris rivers. Okay? So the second kingdom would have to overtake this kingdom, right? Boy, did it ever. Here's the Medo-Persian Empire. And you can see it totally consumed the Babylonian Empire and then expanded, especially to the east, but also started expanding to the west. Um, into Egypt and into Europe. Okay, what about the third kingdom? Yes, the Grecian Empire, they expanded even more. We already had a humongous empire, but they expanded even more. Okay, what about that bad boy called Rome? After all, that's what all the theologians, or most of the theologians say, uh, took over uh, these three. So let's look at it. There's Rome. Where is it in relationship to Babylon? Well, it's a long ways away from Babylon. Doesn't even, doesn't even have Babylon. Doesn't even have the Tigris or Euphrates River. Okay. Uh, dreadful, terrifying, exceedingly strong. Well, yeah, it was, but not in the 
sense of overtaking the other three kingdoms. Um, it, teeth and iron and claws of bronze were divided, broke to pieces, and stamped what was left of the other three kingdoms. Not even close. Was the, uh, the Roman Empire, as great as it was, it was a Eurocentric empire. Okay, yes, it had all the shoreline of the Mediterranean Sea, and that included Israel. But it had had nothing to do with the Babylonian Empire. It had almost nothing to do with the Medo-Persian Empire. So what about the Islamic Caliphate, the Ottoman Empire? How does it fit in this picture? Picture's worth a thousand words, right? The Ottoman Empire was very much Babylonian-centric. It was very much terrifying and dreadful and exceedingly strong, which we've already went through that criteria. And may I add, it was one of the longest lasting empires out there from 632 AD to 1923 AD. So, that is many, many hundreds of years. So what about the Islamic empire today? You know, is there a residual out there? Are there Islamic nations? If so, where? Uh, if we think there could be a, a revised Islamic caliphate, a revised Ottoman empire, how does that fit in with today's present picture, All right? There you go. The countries in green are Islamic countries. And the little bitty nation you see right there is Israel. And they're surrounded by countries that hate them with unmitigated hate. They might seem a little friendly, some of them, on the surface, but down below, their religion dictates that they hate them. And so we will stop this part of the presentation and continue in a part.